Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this gathering of Followers of the Way on Sunday, 9th July, 2023. We worship an amazing God who gives generously to his people. The fruits of the Spirit include love, peace, and joy. What wonderful, wonderful gifts. Walk around the streets and ask how many people have love peace and joy very very few they yearn for it they long for it and poor people they do not understand that there is a god in heaven who longs to bestow those gifts upon them as the people of god we do not see as the world sees but we understand the spiritual realities behind physical appearances these are days of great darkness deception discouragement and fear but things are not as they appear. Look at the newspapers and TV news, and you would imagine that the enemy is everywhere victorious, that we are done for, and that there is no hope. That, brothers and sisters, could not be further from the truth. Our God is arising in power in these days, in these na this nation, and across the face of this planet. He is bearing his holy arm to do mighty works amongst us. And our job is to understand the times and to respond as our God directs. As I was thinking about our gathering this morning, I was reminded of an incident from the early days of the First World War. As the German army swept westwards, it drove all before it and Paris was threatened. The Germans got within a few miles of Paris and all seemed lost. The people of Paris were in despair. There was panic everywhere. And at that moment, the commander of the French forces, Marshal, uh, Marshal Foch, it was, said this. My center is giving way. My right is in retreat. Situation excellent. I shall attack. And and what is called to this day the miracle of the Marne, the Paris taxis turned out en masse to ferry troops to the front line for a counterattack. The counterattack was successful. The Germans were driven back and Paris was never again threatened. Things are not as they appear. This is counterattack time. This is the time that God is going to do great things amongst us. Do not be discouraged. Do not give up hope. These are glory days amidst the crisis that we see all around. Today, we're going to continue our sermon series from the book of Acts, a time again when darkness was across the face of the earth, but God through his people brought light and brought breakthrough. David is going to be speaking to us a little bit later about how to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others. That's our call, whoever we are, wherever we are, and whatever the times may be. So with that by way of introduction, let's just offer ourselves and this time to the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. O oh, Elohim, creator God, Adonai Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, Lord God of Sabaoth, Lord of hosts, you are mighty and great in power. We have come today to worship you, to raise high the name of Jesus, to sit at your feet and to receive from you whatever it is that you care to give, be it great or be it small. Will you help us, please, to worship you today in a way that will please you, that will glorify you, that will bring a smile to your face, because you are our Father and we are your children. Amen. And so with that, we're going to go into a time of sung praise, and Jane is going to lead us in that. Jane. Thank you, Philip going to begin with a, a great song rejoice rejoice christ is in you christ is in us <laughs> rejoice, rejoice. 
rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope of glory in our hearts. He lifts, he lifts his breath, is in you, arise a mighty army. We arise. Now is the time for us to march upon the land. To our hands, he will give the ground we claim. He rides in majesty to lead us into victory. The world shall see that Christ is Lord. Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope, the glory in our hearts. He lives, he lives, his breath is in you. Arise, a mighty army, your eyes. God is at work in us, his purpose to perform, building a kingdom of power, not of words. Where things impossible, my faith shall be made possible. Let's give the glory to him now. Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope, the glory in our hearts. He lives, he lives, his breath is in you, arise a mighty army. We are all Though we are weak, his grace is everything we need. We may the clay, but this treasure is within. He turns our weaknesses into his opportunities so that the glory goes to him. Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope of glory in our hearts. He lives, he lives, his breath is in you, arise, a mighty army. We arise, we arise. Thank you, Lord. We offer ourselves to you now. We are your children. We are your hands and feet in this world. We are your voice. Please use us. Are we ready to be light? God's 
seeking out a very special people to manifest his truth and his might. Here I am, only a To do that, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me more. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Thank you, Jane. Yes, how we need the spirit of the living God to fall afresh on us as individuals and afresh on our nation. We know that we are in dire straits as a nation. And so as we move now to a time of confession, I'd like to do things differently from the way that we habitually do them, because I'd like us to orientate this towards praying for our nation. And we're going to do that using an adaptation of the extraordinary prayer that Daniel prayed for his nation, as he understood that the time of exile was coming to a close. You'll find this in Daniel chapter 9. It's a long prayer. We're only going to take segments of it, and we're going to adapt it for uh, this nation, the United Kingdom. And so remain muted. But I would like to invite you, if you feel able, in crying out to God for our land at this time. O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who speak, spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. Our whole nation has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, we are under judgment because we have sinned against you. Disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favour of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. O oh Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, 
turn away your anger and your wrath from us. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made us an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servants. For your sake, O Lord, look with favour on this nation. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O oh our God, do not delay. Amen. Brothers and sisters, cry out for this nation. Cry out for this land. Oh, how we need God. We have made such a hash of things. There is no way back for us unless he comes to restore us and lift us from the mire. We have sunk into a deep pit and only God can get us out. Cry out for our people. Oh, yeah. Praise your name, Lord. Praise your name. We're going to turn to read from the scriptures. And Cliff is going to read to us now from the Bible. Cliff, over to you, please. Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26, reading from the UK variant of the NIV translation. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians and is often pronounced as Candace. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, or Ashdod, and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Here ends the reading of the Lord. Thank you, Cliff. David's going to expound this scripture to us. Let's just pray for him briefly before he does so. 
Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of your servant, David. We ask, please, that you will inspire him, quite literally breathe into him by the Holy Spirit now, so that his words may be your words, his thoughts may be your thoughts. And will you please cause us to have receptive minds and hearts for what you wish to give us today? Amen. David, over to you. Amen. Thank you, Philip. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that the Lord Jesus can use you to bear fruit that is a blessing to others in these challenging days of 2023? You know, Jesus <clears throat> declares in the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. In other words, um, we need to ask ourselves, are we bearing much fruit? Because if we're not, then the implications are to ask the question, are we truly a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because he says that we show ourselves to be his disciples by bearing much fruit. So he wants to, uh, us to live a fruitful life that is an um, instrument of blessing to others. This passage of scripture here that um, uh, Cliff just read here in Acts the 8th chapter verses 26 to 40 shows us how <clears throat> the Lord used Philip to bear fruit and to be his instrument of blessing to an Ethiopian eunuch. And this Ethiopian eunuch, he was uh, secretary of the treasury of the Candace uh, dynasty of Ethiopia and served under the queen of Ethiopia. So he was in a very powerful and a very important uh, position. But his position and his power that he enjoyed serving under the uh, queen of Ethiopia uh, didn't satisfy his inward yearning and desire and search for real meaning and purpose in life. And no doubt it was this inward thirst that he had um, of his soul for real meaning and real purpose in life that prompted this Ethiopian eunuch to make this journey to Jerusalem, which he had come to know was the center of uh, Jewish worship, and which, of course, he might have also heard was the place where this man by the name of Jesus Christ had caused quite a stir amongst uh, the people. Now we're told that he come to Jerusalem to worship, and actually the Greek word that is used here for worship means that he was on a pilgrimage. So this Ethiopian eunuch, he went to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, but he left without his inward spiritual hunger satisfied. But the Lord knew the desire of this Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, so the Lord sent Philip to be his instrument of blessing to this man. Let me ask again, do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ can use you and me to bear fruit and to be his instrument of blessing to others in these challenging days of 2023 where we live in a world of wokeness and cancel culture and everything else that we're seeing in the darkness all around us. I believe there's four things, at least, that we can learn from uh, this passage of Scripture um, that can help us to be able to learn how we can bear fruit as a disciple of Jesus Christ. First of all, uh, to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need guidance from the Lord. And of course, um, uh, to be able to receive guidance um, from the Lord, we have to be in tune with uh, the Lord's Spirit. And uh, we initially come into that relationship with His Holy Spirit through our 
um, heartfelt repentance, turning away from our own selfish we uh, ways and our sin, sinful ways. And we ask the Lord to forgive us and to cleanse us. And uh, we invite him into our hearts to be the only Lord and Savior of our lives. And um, in doing so, he will birth his Holy Spirit within us. And then as one of the Lord's sheep, who is now in his fold, we must learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who lives within us as he leads us and as he guides us. Jesus said there in the uh, 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 4, that his sheep follow him because they know his voice. A few days ago, I read about someone who had created their Sunday sermon entirely with the help of AI, uh, artificial intelligence. And my immediate thought was that this was surely blasphemous, since I believe that sermons need to be created through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, just this morning, early, about 4 a.m., the Lord uh, seems to like to, to wake me up in the uh, early hours of the morning. And this morning, about 4 a.m., the Lord was waking me up and reminding me. You know, he, he leads me, for instance, in, uh, by his Holy Spirit in writing down uh, sermon notes. But then, oftentimes, he challenges. He says, um, are you willing to toss the notes aside and just be willing to be led by my Holy Spirit. You know, a real test of my own faith and dependency to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit. Of course, as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, we need to learn to distinguish between our own fleshy thoughts and uh, the voice or the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And this is only possible when we learn to live from day to day by God's Spirit and not by the natural inclination of our own fleshy nature. The Apostle Paul, he reminds us there in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 16 and 17. So he says, so I say to you, live by the Spirit. You know, that's every day how we need to be able to learn to live by the Holy Spirit's guidance. Live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature or the flesh for this flesh uh, which is uh, uh, our sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature and i'm sure that philip had obviously learned to distinguish uh, between what was guidance from the lord's spirit and what was from his own fleshy nature for instance uh, Philip didn't say, well, I wonder if this idea of going down to Gaza is my own idea. Some foolish compulsion uh, to get away from Jerusalem for the day. No, I believe that Philip had learned to distinguish between his own fleshy thoughts and the voice or prompting of the Holy Spirit. We also need uh, to know and understand that the um, Holy Spirit will never uh, guide us to do what is contrary to his uh, written word. That's why it's so important that we, um, uh, that we know what is written in uh, the word of God, uh, because he's not going to go against what he has already guided us and written in his word. Uh, Jesus declares there in the uh, Gospel of uh, John, chapter 14, verse 26, the counselor of the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. You know, we also need to, uh, to know and understand that the Lord more often than not speaks to us, I believe, through the gentle whisper or promptings of his Holy Spirit within our heart. We read in the Old Testament in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse 12, when the prophet Elijah had become discouraged and desperately needed to hear uh, the voice of the Lord bringing him hope and guidance, the Lord spoke into his heart by a gentle whisper. 
But in order to hear the Lord's gentle whisper or promptings, we need to be able to spend time, take time to be quiet uh, before the Lord, spend time with him in his presence. Um, need to step back. And that's so difficult, isn't it, sometimes to do, to be able to step back from our the noise and the activity of our busy lives um, and quietly listen for the Lord's voice to guide us as we spend time with him and his word and as we go about our uh, daily activities to be able to still in our spirit, to be able to be quiet before him, to be able to be open to the guidance and the promptings of his Holy Spirit. You know, in regards to Philip, the Lord, uh, of course, first, we're told, used an angel to convey his message to Philip. But then uh, in, in verse number 26, but then in verse number 29, we read where he spoke into his heart by his Holy Spirit. Now, why did Philip need to hear um, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into his heart? Why did he need guidance from the Lord? Well, because uh, the Lord wanted him to bear fruit for his glory. And as Philip, um, our Philip mentioned uh, earlier about the fact that these were dark days in the book of Acts, but God was using his people, the believers in him, to again penetrate the darkness with the good news of Jesus Christ. But they had to be open to listen to his promptings, to his voice, to be able to take advantage of those opportunities so that they could bear fruit for his glory. And of course, uh, Philip, he wanted to use Philip. So Philip needed to hear uh, the Holy Spirit's promptings uh, if he was going to bear fruit for the Lord's glory. And of course, the Lord's plan was for Philip to uh, meet up with an Ethiopian eunuch in order to share the good news about Jesus with him. So first of all, to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need guidance from the Lord. But secondly, to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need to obey the Lord. As believers and followers of Jesus Christ, not only do we need uh, guidance from the Lord, but we also need then to obey the Lord in the way that he is guiding us. Um, Jesus said there in John, the 14th chapter, verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So, so Philip, he not only heard the Lord's voice guiding him, but he then immediately proceeded to obey the Lord. Philip didn't say, Lord, um, um, oh, yeah, in the next week or two, um, I'll try to find the time to do what I believe that you're guiding me to do. It has such a temptation sometimes in the busyness of our lives, isn't it? Um, Lord, uh, yeah, I hear you, but Lord, I, I'm really busy right now. Maybe, uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, maybe the next day. Um, well, Philip didn't say that. Um, actually, in Acts the eighth chapter, verse twenty-six, the Greek word that is used there for the word south, whenever uh, the angel of the Lord told uh, Philip to go south, actually the Greek word is uh, mesembria, which also means midday or noon. Now, Philip obviously would have known the fact that the road from Jerusalem to Gaza went south out of Jerusalem. So I believe that the better translation of this word is probably noon. So the Lord wanted Philip on that road at a specific time in order for Philip to bear fruit and to be his instrument of blessing to an Ethiopian eunuch. Philip didn't question the Lord and say, uh, Lord, why do I have to go now? Uh, that road through the desert is a uh, blazing hot uh, in midday. Why can't I wait until a little bit cooler time during the day? But if Philip was going to be used by the Lord to be his instrument of blessing to this Ethiopian eunuch, it would require his unhesitating 
obedience with no questions asked. My wife, Jean, and I, we um, have um, uh, very often um, found ourselves recently um, in uh, Waterloo, London's Waterloo Station. And um, we're always mindful as far as uh, the time that our train is leaving London Waterloo Station. Um, you know, if, um, uh, by the way, we have a very special uh, understanding, if you uh, want to know. We have a very special understanding with the Southwest trains. The fact that if uh, we're not there on time, just we said, just go ahead and leave without us. Uh, well, of course, you know, if our train is supposed to leave at 9.23 a.m. and we arrive at 9.30 a.m., we decide to linger in the coffee shop uh, for a few minutes longer, um, of course, we're more than likely going to miss our train. And um, you see, Philip's situation was not much different than uh, this as far as his need to uh, get on a specific train at a specific location at a specific time. Um, an Ethiopian eunuch was going by in a chariot at a specific location at a specific time. And if Philip had been hesitant to obey and to go immediately, whenever the Lord prompted him, he would have missed bearing fruit for the Lord's glory and being his instrument of blessing to that Ethiopian eunuch. You know, Philip didn't have the slightest idea that the reason that he was being guided to go down to Gaza on that Gaza road was because he was going to meet this Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, we know because uh, we, we uh, read about the, the story in hindsight, but Philip didn't have a clue. Why is he being sent down this road? Um, and he didn't have any idea he's going to meet an Ethiopian eunuch uh, traveling in, by in a chariot. Philip simply had to blindly go in obedience to the Lord's guidance. You know, I wonder how many of us as believers in Jesus Christ, we, you know, we can go through the routine of uh, being a part of a, a Sunday morning uh, service and maybe perhaps a weekly Bible study. Uh, and we can, though, totally miss um, bearing fruit for the Lord's glory from week to week because why we're too preoccupied uh, with other things to listen to the Lord's voice and to respond in obedience to his guidance. You know, the Lord will give us just enough guidance for the first step that we are to take. And then we are to step out in obedience. And as we step out in obedience and we take the first step, well, then uh, he will then guide us in the next step that we are to take. You know, some of us might be tempted to uh, want to know yeah, such a temptation is it to want to be able to know the Lord's full plan uh, in details before we take that first step. You know, Lord, why? You know, why are you wanting me to do this? Lord, show me the end before I take that first step. But that's not how the Lord works. He wants us to be able to step out in faith, take that first step of obedience and um, not even knowing what it is that the next step is going to be. You know, Philip didn't ask the Lord why he was supposed to go and do what the Lord had asked him to do in taking that first step of obedience. Philip just obeyed the Lord's initial guidance in taking that first step. And we read, we read where the angel of the Lord says, go. And I believe he said at noon time on this road going down from uh, Jerusalem towards Gaza. Um, go. Philip, okay, you know, I don't know why I'm being sent, but I'll, I'll go, Lord. 
now, now, you know, and so he goes. And then after he had made that initial step of faith and obedience, then the Lord told him in verse 29, go to that chariot and stay near it. So that's the next step of obedience. You see the Lord uh, just guiding by his Holy Spirit and prompting, but it takes uh, Philip's obedience, immediate obedience. Now, I wonder how many times maybe we miss the Lord's plan for us to bear fruit for his glory because we fail to take that first step of obedient faith. Do we think that the Lord is going to reveal his big picture of his plan if we just wait long enough? Now, I believe that we will never know what the Lord has in store for us unless we step out in obedient faith, take that first step of his guidance. And we must not be mistakenly waiting for the Lord's big picture before of his plan before we take that first step in obedience to his initial guidance. I believe the hymn writer uh, discovered this truth when he wrote, when we walk with the Lord, in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. You know, he says, on our way. In other words, as we've stepped out in obedient faith, taking that first step, we're on our way, and the Lord then will continue, you know, to show us the way, but we still have to trust him and obey. What a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will. He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So secondly, to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need to obey the Lord. Thirdly, to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need the grace of the Lord. Philip had no hesitation to be able to jump into the chariot whenever uh, he was invited to come up into the chariot. No questions asked. You know, Philip could have uh, thought, well, wow, do I want to get involved uh, with this uh, this guy up in the chariot? Uh, does he have a pride flag flying uh, in the back of the chariot? Is he a, a leader of the LGBT plus uh, in Ethiopia? Um, you know, he could have asked all kinds of questions, certainly relevant for our own culture and day. Philip didn't answer, uh, ask a single question. It was simply the grace of God that, uh, again, prompted him to immediately accept the Ethiopian's command. No questions asked. You know, uh, he could have had fear. Wow, this uh, guy, whenever he finds out that he's the, uh, uh, the person that he is, you know, serving under the queen of Ethiopia, wow. You know, I better be careful. And fear could have uh, come into his heart. Uh, wow, you know, he could have my uh, uh, head cut off. Um, I wonder what he believes. I wonder what he stands for. I wonder who's he associated with. But none of that. Um, the Lord reminded me this morning. You know, John Newton, when he wrote Amazing Grace, Tis grace that taught my heart to fear. And of course, having the fear of God, fear of his word, a reverent fear. Um, Tis grace that caught, taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. You see that whenever we're so full of the unconditional love and grace of God, it drives out fear. And that's what we need, even as uh, Philip Quinby was uh, uh, mentioning earlier, the fact that we live in a dark age, a woke age, a cancel culture, all these things. 
But uh, yet, uh, if we're full of the grace and the love of God, we have no reason to fear, for grace drives out that fear. We can be so full of the unconditional love and grace of God. Um, so Philip, he had no idea. The chariot had a pride flag flying uh, uh, underneath. You know, is he the leader of the LGBT of Ethiopia? Whatever, no questions asked whatsoever because Philip was full of the grace and unconditional love of God. And um, he simply got up into the chariot when he was invited to go up and sit with him. And he patiently waited for the Ethiopian to ask the next question and search for truth and real meaning and purpose in life. And as we read there in verses uh, 34 and 35, the uh, Ethiopian asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Um, how do we approach others? about our faith in Jesus Christ? Do we make fun or put down the strange beliefs that are expressed by our work colleague? Or do we uh, graciously ask them a question such as, does your beliefs bring you peace that lasts from day one day to the next? You know, do we uh, approach our unbelieving family members uh, with a holier-than-thou attitude, or by giving them a lecture on godliness, or do we approach them in a way that shows Christ's grace and love towards them? Lloyd John Ogilvie, in his book, Drumbeat of Love, that he wrote many years ago, he tells about the time that he went to a party and a lady began to expound on the virtues of transcendental, transcendental meditation. And she mentioned about how she had been given a mantra uh, or a magic word to repeat in her twice daily 15 minute meditation. And she spoke about how she would repeat it in her twice this uh, daily meditation. And in doing so, she it led her in a, a um, a deep identification of herself and reality. Now, Lloyd John Ogilvy, yeah, he didn't put her down for what she was saying, for her beliefs. Uh, he didn't say, oh, how ridiculous, you know, that's a bunch of rubbish or that's garbage, you know, or he didn't say that uh, in words and he certainly didn't say it through his attitudes either. No. He simply affirmed her for her search for reality. But then the Holy Spirit gave him a gracious question to ask her. And he said, does the word that you're using put you in touch with the limitless power that created the universe? And immediately this lady wanted to know, well, what's your word? What is your word? And he told her that his word was the name of Jesus Christ. Lord John Ogilvy went on to say, but she could never have heard me or subsequently given her life to the Savior, Jesus Christ, and learned to pray in his name if I had not taken delight in her and her urgent search. For peace, taking into light, being so full of Christ's unconditional love and grace that we take delight in people around us. You know, some of the uh, people that uh, make us cringe, but yet the love of God so filling our hearts. We don't question them, we don't put them down, but we simply are so full of grace and love that uh, it spills over into their lives. And the Lord enabled uh, 
Lord John Ogilvy to, to approach this late in a gracious way. So to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need the grace of the Lord. But fourthly and finally, to live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need to have an unwavering trust in the Lord to be at work by his Holy Spirit in the lives of others. You know, no doubt in Philip's conversation with the Ethiopian eunuch, he had spoken about Christ's teaching, about the need to be baptized, and its symbolism that we are buried with him uh, through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, uh, that we too may live a new life. So the symbolism of baptism itself. And, you know, there's no indication that Philip put any pressure on the Ethiopian unit to be baptized. No, Philip, he waited for the Holy Spirit to do his work within the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch and for the Lord's timing. And uh, we read there in verse 37 and 38 um, that the Ethiopian eunuch, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, Here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he ordered the chariot to stop. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. You know, Philip's faith was not based um, on uh, uh, his own ability to try to manipulate the Ethiopian eunuch's response. No, his faith was based in complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit to do his work within the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch? I think it's a good question we need to ask ourselves. Do we have faith uh, in what Jesus promises in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 9, 9? Do we believe that it will be the work of His Holy Spirit uh, to do the work of convicting and convincing others of guilt in regards to sin and righteousness and judgment? Um, if we truly believe, then, of course, I believe prayer becomes a priority as we ask the Holy Spirit to do his work within the hearts of those to whom he's wanting to change. But I believe the question is, do we really trust the Holy Spirit to do his work? Do we think that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, needs us to do his work? I think sometimes we're so guilty of actually saying, okay, now I'm going to do your work uh, of convicting, uh, but that is the Holy Spirit's work. You know, if we try to manipulate others, including our spouse, our children, into changing or doing what we believe that they should do or what they should be, I believe that's a sure sign of our own lack of trust in the Holy Spirit to do His work within their lives and our own lack of faith in the power of prayer. Um, I'll close with this. There's um, uh, when Gene and I were working with drug addicts um, about 29, 30 years ago in southwest England. Um, there was a, uh, a drug addict and a heroin dealer by the name of Shane who had been in and out of prison on several occasions and had lived a, a life of violent crime. And he came to faith in Jesus Christ as Jean and I used every opportunity. They were living in the ground floor flat below us. Hundreds coming and going, dealing drugs. And um, the Lord used Jean and I to use every opportunity to show Christ's unconditional love and grace to Shane and to the many drug addicts that were coming and going. You know, there weren't, um, there were so many things that needed to change in Shane's life. Um, and he graciously came to faith in Jesus Christ. His life was changed, but there was many, many, many changes that needed to take place in his life. It was uh, kind of a temptation to uh, try to spur Shane along by uh, uh, pointing out the need for certain areas of his life to be changed or by giving him a lecture um, about his ungodly ways. But instead, we chose to put our trust in the Holy Spirit to be at work 
in his life. And for the Lord's timing, as he continued to, as we continued to earnestly pray for Shane, and it was always encouraging to have him come to us. And uh, he would say, you know, I believe that the Holy Spirit is convicting me about the need to change in this particular area of my life. What do I need to do to be able to initiate this change and, and to see it become a reality in my life? And then there came a time when Shane then came and asked and said, I, I believe I need to be baptized in obedience to Jesus' command. What can we do? I, I want to be baptized. To live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others, we need to trust the Lord. This story about Philip and the Ethiopian unit, it concludes with another miraculous sign there in verses 39 to 40. Um, whenever we're told that they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the Ethiopian did not see him again, but they went on, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Now, Azotus was uh, nine miles away from Gaza, and Caesarea was about 60 miles away. And Caesarea had a large Greek-speaking population. So Philip being miraculously transported away by the Spirit of the Lord, I believe it's, it was a sign of uh, an urgent need for Philip to continue to bear fruit and to be the Lord's instrument of blessing to others who lived in the towns from Azotus to Caesarea. You know, if Philip had an urgent need, I believe that it's no different for you and for me today. Such an urgent need to be the Lord's uh, instrument of blessing, bearing fruit for his glory uh, in this day of 2023. Do you believe, though, that the Lord can use you to bear fruit that is a blessing to others in this woke, cancel culture world that we live in? Four things to be live a fruitful life that is a blessing to others. We need guidance from the Lord. We need to obey the Lord. We need the grace of the Lord. And we need to trust the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much for that, David. Um, I absolutely agree with you. There is an urgent need for God's people to be his instrument of blessing in this world today. And um, God demands fruitfulness, but he is not unfair. He doesn't ask of us something that we're un unable to, to give. He also enables our fruitfulness through the gift of the Holy Spirit and the working of the Holy Spirit within us to cause us to do the things that Jesus did and as Jesus said, to do even greater things. Hallelujah. One of the things that David spoke about, the fourth item on his list, was our need for unwavering trust in the Lord. And we're going to pick up on precisely that now by making a, a statement of our trust, our declaration of faith. And as we... Um, as we speak these things with our mouths, let's bring our hearts and our minds and our spirits into alignment with the things that we are saying so that this becomes a, a, an, an integral thing from our whole being. What we believe, what we trust in, and what consequently we will allow God to do for us. So stay muted. But say to, uh, with me, if you are able, this declaration of our faith. We believe in the Holy Scriptures as originally given by God, divinely inspired, infallible, entirely trustworthy, and the supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct. We believe in one God, 
eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. His virgin birth, his sinless human life, his divine miracles, his vicarious and atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension, his mediatorial work, and his personal return in power and glory. We believe in the salvation of lost and sinful man through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith apart from works. And we believe in regeneration by the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit by whose indwelling the believer is enabled to live a holy life to witness and work for the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the unity of the spirit of all true believers, the church, the body of Christ. And we believe in the resurrection of both the saved and the lost. They that are saved unto the resurrection of life. They that are lost unto the resurrection of damnation. Amen. So we're going to turn now to a time of prayer, and I'd like to invite Helen, please, to lead us in that. Helen, over to you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. When we come into the presence of God, the author of, the author of Hebrews gives us a powerful description of our position in him. He writes, you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. With this reminder of where we stand in Jesus and that we're not battling this battle on our own in the world, but we are surrounded by this host of glorious, victorious men and angels. Let's just take a few minutes to prepare ourselves, scattered physically, but one in Christ spiritually, to enter into our Father's presence, to pray for the nation, the church and ourselves, freshly encouraged and empowered by this vision of our enormous privilege as forgiven, given, forgiven sinners to enjoy all the company of heaven. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Heavenly Father, there was a time when this nation, with all its faults and failures, did acknowledge you to be our God and seek to make laws in keeping with your commandments. You have used us and blessed us and saved us and dealt with us in ways that we did not deserve. But now we have turned our back on you, rejected you, and worship gods of our own making, as in the days of the judges of Israel. We're beginning to reap the consequences of our folly and recognize the justice of your wrath against us. But you are the same God who again and again, in the time of your wrath, remembered mercy. So we dare to come humbly before you now and plead for the restoration of our nation to the ways of righteousness. Nothing is impossible with you. Therefore, gracious Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to once more refresh our land with spiritual revival. We can only plead our desperate need for your mercy, knowing that as a nation, we deserve judgment. And we pray for the church. Remember that Jesus told us, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. 
in this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Father, we pray for His Majesty King Charles, that you will clear the muddle in his understanding of spiritual things and turn his heart and mind to the one true God, the only Saviour. We lift to all those in high positions within the Church of England and other denominations, particularly those who've turned away from your word and are leading both the nation and, nation and your people astray. We pray that in your mercy, you would call them to repentance and free them from error, that they may bring saving light to a nation in deep darkness and restore the confidence of your faithful people. We thank you for all those who do faithfully minister to our brothers and sisters and pray for their protection from all the assaults of the enemy. We thank you that we still have freedom to openly worship you and proclaim the gospel. And for those who, who uh, stand for the truth, risking their jobs and reputations or being treated like criminals when they hold to biblical principles. Strengthen the various organizations and ministries that seek to defend righteousness on our behalf. Protect all our brothers and sisters on the front line of battle. May they be aware of the need to wear the full armor of God at all times. We thank you for every one of them. And we especially plead for you to comfort, strengthen and deliver all those who are suffering imprisonment or fierce persecution in many parts of the world. We thank you for their courage and steadfastness and praise you for the growth of the body of Christ resulting from their faithfulness. May their example encourage us to be patient under affliction, be it of body, mind or spirit, trusting that in all things you work for the good of those who love you. Help us, Lord, to remember that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against those powers and principalities, invisible to us but mighty, in their worldwide and insidious influence. We can so easily be discouraged and even despairing by the decline of moral values and even common sense everywhere about us and confess that sometimes we don't even know how or what to pray in, in a culture, in a world that seems to be going mad. Oh Lord, how easy it is for us to forget that you are sovereign. Your ways are not ours. But if you permit all the onslaught of folly and wickedness, you have a perfect purpose far beyond our understanding, but not beyond our faith to live in patient expectation for your glory to be revealed in all the world. And when our prayers seem ineffectual, when weariness discourages us, help us to remember that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness that our sighs, our groans of frustration become weapons in the invisible warfare as he carries them into your presence. Help us to see our prayers in that light and inspire us to realize the power even of our sighs. Jesus said to us, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Lord, is your kingdom people you command us to delight in you, to trust in you and do good. So we ask you give us a deep desire to share the good news of salvation with family, friends, workmates, neighbours and strangers. That you inspire us in, in, in us a deeper commitment to your last command, go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. Help us, like Philip, to take advantage of unexpected opportunities. Give us the will and the courage to pray for those opportunities in spite of our natural reluctance and fear. Take away our fear of upsetting or offending people. Give us a gentle boldness, trust in the Holy Spirit. It will give us the right words for the occasion. And go before us by your Spirit, leading us to an encounter with someone who, like the Ethiopian, may already be seeking truth. Above all, help us to examine ourselves 
so that we may conduct ourselves with integrity in all our daily actions and affairs. The Lord and Heavenly Father, we trust ourselves into your loving care. Where we are weak, give us strength. Where we lack faith, give us confidence. Where we are cold, warm our hearts afresh through your grace and endless mercy. Renew us day by day by your Holy Spirit so that we can stand our ground against our tireless enemies, the world, the flesh and the devil, and overcome them more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. We thank you, Lord, that more and more Jews are seeking to know the real Jesus. Thank you for the huge and ongoing demand for Bibles in the Ukraine. Thank you for the growing number of schools, both here and across the world, signing up to the Bible Society's program for local believers to take the story of Jesus into the classroom. And we thank you for the recent and encouraging advances in cancer, dementia, and other research programs. There are so many things for us to be grateful for in our daily lives that I should like us to close our prayers this morning with the words of the general thanksgiving from the Book of Common Prayer, which encompasses all the undeserved blessings that are poured out on us day by day. We can sometimes forget in our struggle against evil are the many, many blessings that we receive and perhaps don't even think about. If you remember the words, do join with me while remaining muted. So the general thanksgiving from the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, an unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all mankind. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Helen. As we continue with the prayer that Jesus taught us, let's do that, that bold thing of offering ourselves to God to be the answer to the prayers that we pray. Um, let us be people who bring in the kingdom. Let us be ones who are the channel through which God provides his daily bread and so on and so forth. And so we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We turn now to bring to God those very personal things about people who are dear to us who are suffering. We bring to the Lord the sick and suffering, those who are heavy laden, those who mourn and grieve, those who are weary, tired and anxious. Their needs do not go unnoticed by our God. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless and restore all those who are troubled in body, mind or spirit that we're now going to name before him. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Spirit, may God in his perfect compassion 
restore all these dear ones that we have named, either with our lips or in our hearts, and speedily send them complete healing of body, mind, soul, and spirit. Lord God, let healing come speedily, and let us all say, Amen. We human beings were made to worship God. It is not a duty thing. It's a joyful thing. It's part of who we are. It's part of the, the stepping into the fullness of our humanity. And we're going to ask Jane now to lead us in a song of worship. Jane. Thank you, Philip. We're going to sing the song that David referred to earlier. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, we trust and obey. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt, nor a fear, not a sign, nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, than to trust and obey. Hallelujah. A lovely song to end with, Jane. Thank you very much. I love the ironic blessing. I love to place the name of God on you. As people. Open your hearts to receive this blessing and to have his name put upon you again this day. Hashem, the name.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you shalom. Shalom, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord. And so now, as we turn to go our separate ways, whether it be to a breakout room or to the other things that this day the Lord has made, has in store for us, I say go in peace to love and serve the Lord and all God's people say, in the name of Christ. Amen.